I want you all to be my students in a class called Climate Change Along California's Coast. And I want you to imagine that we're partly through the semester. So last week, as you all recall, in Climate Change Along California's <laughs> Coast, we talked about sea level rise. And this week, what we're going to focus on is, o is ocean acidification. So here's an outline for today's class and some key concepts that I want you guys to think about and focus on as we talk today. So the first is the cause of ocean acidification, why it's happening. The second is the biological impacts, or some of them. We'll talk about some of them today. Then third is management implications of this environmental issue. And lastly, we're going to talk about some educational needs and opportunities revolving around this environmental issue. Okay, so before I get going explaining the, co uh, the cause of ocean acidification, I want you guys to do a little exercise with me. We're going to do some word association. And this is just to get our brains thinking about ocean acidification, get us to remember things that we've learned or heard about this before. Or if you don't know anything about ocean acidification, that's totally fine too. Just words that come to mind when you see ocean acidification. Um, so what I want you to do is you guys individually, if you have a piece of paper or a computer, you can write down a few words that come to mind. If not, just use that brain and think about a couple words. So I'm going to give you guys just a few seconds to think, and then I'll have a few of you guys share some words that come to mind when you hear ocean acidification. So take 15 to 20 seconds, and um, I'll let you know when I'm ready to hear some of these words. Okay. Anyone have anything they want to share? Just what do you associate with this? Thin. Thin. Yes, in the back. Um, I mean, I just ask like what it is, or just ask the associated words. Yeah, anything, any word that comes to mind, something you know about it. Okay, well, ocean acidification is basically when this excess carbon dioxide and the gas exchange that happens in the ocean it drops the pH and causes. Awesome. Show off. <laughs> <laughs> Great. That was, that was good. That was a lot of, a lot of knowledge. <laughs> Anything else that comes to mind? I thought climate change. Okay. Climate change. Great. Changing ecosystems. Changing ecosystems. Great. Yes. Damages? Damages? Okay. okay. Okay, great. Well, this is a good start. Just wanted to get us thinking about what we know, maybe what we don't know here about, what some of our classmates know. Um, and so keep these in mind as we talk more about the specifics in today's class. So some people mentioned climate change is something they associate with ocean acidification, and I want to start with just refreshing what we've learned about climate change. Some people call it a carbon dioxide problem. It is also caused by other gases, but climate change can be thought of as a human-caused enhancement of the natural greenhouse effect. And this image here shows the greenhouse effect. So the greenhouse effect is something that naturally occurs on our planet. It actually is really important and positive. It keeps the earth at a livable temperature so that all the animals and plants, including us, can live on this planet. So we have the sun shining rays onto the earth. It heats the earth. Some of that heat is re-radiated back out into the atmosphere. And this is the greenhouse, the atmosphere where greenhouse gases are. Those greenhouse gases, like carbon dioxide and methane, capture that heat and then they re-radiate it back out. So some of that re-radiation heat actually goes back out into the atmosphere, but some of it comes back up, back down towards Earth, and it keeps the Earth a little bit insulated and warm. The problem with climate change is that humans, through activities like burning fossil fuels, are releasing more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. So more greenhouse gases means more heat re-radiated back down to Earth and increased temperatures all over the globe, and other associated issues with the climate. So that's just to review climate change. Ocean acidification is sometimes called the other CO2 problem. So about a 
quarter to a third of the CO2 that is emitted into the atmosphere diffuses into our ocean. And this, again, is a natural process where the gas is coming to equilibrium, it's moving between the atmosphere and the ocean, but as humans are putting more greenhouse gases, including carbon dioxide, into the atmosphere, more of it diffuses into the ocean to reach that equilibrium. At first, when we found out that about a third of the CO2 we emit is going to the oceans, people thought, great, less climate change. That means less of the carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere, warming our planet. The oceans are helping protect us from that climate change. The problem is, is that CO2 in the oceans isn't benign. It actually is causing some issues in the oceans. So, CO2, as we mentioned in gas form, diffuses into the ocean, and then it's in aqueous form in the ocean. And when it's in the ocean, it undergoes a chemical reaction that we call ocean acidification. So I'm going to do up on this screen, we're going to look at the chemical equations. And on the board, you guys can look in two places at the same time. I'm just going to write it out in words for those of us who uh, learn better with words versus the chemical formulas. So over here, we have the air-water interface. We have carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We have it coming down into the ocean. So we have carbon dioxide here too. And what happens is carbon dioxide interacts in a chemical reaction with a molecule that is super common in seawater. Does anyone know what that molecule is? It's okay. <laughs> it's, oh, I heard it. Yeah, it's water. So sea, in seawater, water is super common, and so it interacts with water, which, as you mentioned, chemical formula for that is H2O. When it combines with H2O, it forms carbonic acid. So here's the first time we see ocean acidification. There is an increase in carbonic acid in the ocean because of this really simple reaction that takes place. That carbonic acid is a pretty unstable molecule, which means it dissociates uh, easily into these two, now it goes to bicarbonate and hydrogen ions or protons. The end result of this process is an increase in the hydrogen ions in the water. And what that means is a decrease in pH. So some of you might remember from chemistry classes that what pH, pH can be measured by looking at the hydrogen ions. So you increase hydrogen ions in a uh, fluid, and that means you're decreasing the pH. So water tends to be neutral, seven, uh, that's fresh water. We have some bases that are higher in pH and acids that are lower in pH. Seawater is generally around 8.2, so it's actually a little basic, but this process is decreasing the pH of the seawater. At the same time that that's happening, calcium carbonate, which somebody mentioned in our word association, is naturally being formed and dissolving in the ocean. So <coughs> organisms like oysters, which I study, some of you were at my research talk yesterday, they make their shells out of calcium carbonate. And um, the way they do that is they're actually able to extract the calcium and the carbonate from the seawater and form calcium carbonate to make their hard body parts. So a lot of animals do that with their shells or their skeletons. And this process, going from calcium carbon and carbonate to calcium carbonate happens naturally, but also there is a dissolution process where calcium carbonate turns back into calcium and carbonate, um, which is then freely moving around in the ocean. So that's happening at the same time. 
While these two chemical reactions are happening, when we have increased hydrogen ions in the water, they have a propensity to bond with carbonate. So this increased hydrogen ions comes and bonds with that carbonate. And when there are lots of them, as is happening because of the increased CO2 in the atmosphere, into the ocean, chemical process, getting to have lots of hydrogen ions, it actually facilitates the breakup of this calcium carbonate. These hydrogen ions have such a propensity to bond with the carbonate that they're able to facilitate that's a little break, like glass breaking. <laughs> They're able to facilitate that breaking apart. Okay, so that's the chemistry. What I want you guys to see now is what does that mean for an animal that is made of calcium carbonate? So to give you a feel for the animal, here is a shell of an Olympia oyster one of my favorite organisms, and I'm just gonna pass this around so you guys can feel the calcium carbonate as we talk more about this. So what happens when calcium carbonate, such as an oyster or a mussel, you guys might eat these, some people had them at dinner, <laughs> I think, last night. Um, what happens when they meet acidified conditions or when they meet all of these hydrogen ions? Okay, so we're gonna do a little dramatic interpretation of this chemical process. Cool. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so it's not exactly what's happening in the ocean that we just described, but it's a very, very similar. No. <laughs> similar, I was trying to combine similar and chemical. Ooh. Similar chemical reaction. It's an interdisciplinary class. Similar oh yeah, exactly. Class. Um, and this, Tums, you guys may sometimes get an upset stomach, maybe you take Tums. Does anyone know what the ingredient in Tums is? Yeah, calcium carbonate. Same thing that makes up oysters. And the reason this works is you might have a bad stomach ache because you have more acid in your stomach put calcium carbonate in, the acid bonds with the carbonate and you're like, feel better. Okay, so this Tums, calcium carbonate, is gonna represent our marine animal. Not quite as cute, but same material. This is some vinegar. I promise you that. <laughs> I wasn't able to bring a whole bottle of vinegar because I brought this on a plane with me, so it's only three ounces of vinegar. But this is vinegar, and vinegar is an acid. It has a really low um, pH, so it is more acidic than the ocean, but it has those extra hydrogen ions, so it represents an acidified ocean. So the vinegar goes in this cup. It's acidified ocean. This is water. I will prove it. <laughs> you love vinegar, I guess. <laughs> um, so water, which is represents non-acidified seawater. So now what we're going to do is take our cute little calcium carbonate marine creature. I should get them to be the same color, so we can think of them as the same, the same organism. So we take our little oysters and we're going to put them in these two different environments. And then I'm going to pass them around and you guys are going to see what happens. All right, so there goes one creature into water, there goes another into vinegar. So I'll send these with Sean and then you guys can just start to look at the difference. It'll, the reaction takes a little while, so, oh, thanks Sean. Um, so you don't have to worry, you'll all get a chance to see what's going on. Okay, so as Sean passes it around, can anyone who has looked at it tell me anything that they notice? Is there a difference? Are they similar? It's dissolving in the vinegar. Yeah, it's dissolving in the vinegar. 
All right, so that's just to show you guys that this chemical reaction actually has this you know, physical, visual thing that you can see. The calcium carbonate is being broken apart. Those hydrogen ions that we can't see in the vinegar are bonding, they're helping to break apart this calcium carbonate and we get carbonate out of it. Um, it's bubbling up because part of that reaction actually releases CO2 because of the chemical composition of uh, the vinegar. Someone is super into chemistry, we can do that equation later. <laughs> All right, so this uh, dramatic interpretation of ocean acidification is actually really similar to what is happening in the ocean. So there are a lot of organisms like the oyster and the mussel that I passed around that have hard parts made of calcium carbonate, and so does this beautiful little creature uh, called a pteropod which is also a sea butterfly. They're quite beautiful pelagic snails. Pelagic meaning open ocean. They're free swimming snails. And um, there's been some recent work looking at what happens to their shells in acidified conditions. And this is what happens. So this is a normal pteropod shell, beautiful. And then as it goes into increasingly acidified conditions, you start to see the breakup of the shell. So that's similar to what's happening to our tums in the vinegar right now, is some breaking up of that calcium carbonate material. And this, um, oh yeah, okay. So the chemical process that we just talked about, the breaking up of the calcium carbonate, that's not the only thing affecting calcium carbonate animals. There's also the fact that when you get these hydrogen ions, I'll use red, um, hydrogen ions bonding with the carbonate, what is produced is again the same thing we saw up here, this hydrogen plus the carbonate is giving us bicarbonate. And the reason it's important to realize that there is increasing bicarbonate in the ocean is that animals can't use that. So they are trying to get carbonate out of the water, but if it's bicarbonate, if it's in this form, they can't break it apart and get the carbonate that they need for their hard part. So that means that as we have increasing carbonate, the end result of this whole reaction is we have increased bicarbonate represented by the bigness of this and decreasing carbonate, which means there are fewer building blocks for the animals to build their hard parts. Does that make sense? Okay. So there's two issues, dissolving and then also they're having a hard part, a hard time making their hard parts to begin with. So, Currently, this is something that's happening now. So this graph shows you current, um, some visuals for current ocean acidification. So some of you might be familiar with the Mauna Loa curve. Um, it's looking at carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So here on this axis, we have carbon dioxide concentrations over time. And over on the other axis, we have pH. So first I just want you guys to look at this pinkish line. And what I just want you to see, this is representing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So over time, from 1960 through till now, we see an increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. If we then look at this dark blue line, that is representing carbon dioxide in the ocean. And we see, just like we discussed in first principles, understanding that carbon dioxide goes into the atmosphere, comes into the ocean, we have actually measured, scientists, not me, but other scientists, have measured carbon dioxide increasing in the ocean, and this line going down is the pH going down. So this is, we're actually being able to measure this chemical change in the ocean already, and along California's coast, um, we're already seeing acidified conditions, which is represented by, so, in case it's not clear, this is the California coastline. The gray is California. And this is the ocean, the colored parts. 
and um, the color represents the warm colors represent uh, increasingly acidified conditions and the cool colors like blues are not acidified so we're seeing acidified water along our coast really close to our coast I want to draw something for you guys. So California is particularly vulnerable to this because we have something called upwelling along our coast. Has anybody learned about that in other classes or yeah? Paul, do you want to explain it briefly? So <clears throat> based upon uh, the winds that we have offshore, it causes um, the tumbling of, uh, of the water where the nutrients from down below come up and mix. So it's kind of like a washing machine of nutrients. Great. Okay, perfect. Yeah, it's based on the winds, which if this is our California coast, we have prevailing winds tend to come this way. And because the world is turning at the same time, we have something called the Coriolis effect, which we don't need to know the details of right now. But it basically means that the water ends up going offshore. When the water moves offshore, we don't just have like a decrease in sea level. If we look at a cross section of our coast, so this is our coast, and here's the water. Water's moving offshore because of those winds that Paul described, and water comes down from the deep to take its place. This deep water is more acidic than the surface water, and that's for two reasons. The first is that when you have CO2 up here in the surface, there are plants up there because there's light. Plants need light, and those plants take in that carbon dioxide, so it's used up. Down here, it's dark in the deep ocean, so CO2 that is respired down here doesn't get used up as much. So that's a natural process by which this gets acidified. The other thing is that this water down deep that's coming up along our shoreline is old water. The last time it was at the surface, on average, about 50 years ago, because the whole ocean is circulating like a washing machine, but that circulation, instead of taking 40 minutes like a washing machine, takes 50 years. So something that was at the surface goes down, winds its way around the ocean, and then comes up to the surface, and it maintains a signal of what was happening at the surface when it sunk. So 50 years ago, we were already experiencing some ocean acidification, so the water that's coming up along our coast was influenced by the Industrial Revolution and is already more acidic than uh, some of the water up here, which has been, the calcium carbonate's been used up. So we in California have an amazing opportunity to study this because we have a natural environment where we have this pH gradient. Okay, then I just want you guys to know that although ocean acidification is happening now, it um, is projected to increase in the future. The International Panel on Climate Change projects there to be about 800 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere by 2100, which is projected to decrease the pH in the ocean by 0.4 units, which is like, oh, 0.4 units, that's small, right, 0.4. The thing about pH is that it's on a logarithmic scale. Do you guys know anything else that's on a logarithmic scale? Have you guys felt an earthquake here yet? <laughs> okay, so I felt a few earthquakes. I've been in California about 15 years. I felt a three, and then I felt a four, and there was a big difference between a three and a four. And that's because the Richter scale, which uh, measures the shaking of an earthquake, is a logarithmic scale. So a three, well, a four is actually 10 times more shaking than a three. That's the same with pH. So 0.4 is actually a pretty big difference. And it's associated with a 
decline in carbonate ions. So remember, that's what organisms need to build their hard parts. So that's a big change. We're expecting to see a really big change. And oh, we don't probably haven't seen acidified water like this in the last maybe 20 million years. So there has been acidified conditions in the past, but the change, the rate at which it's changing is rapid, and we haven't seen this in a long time. So like we discussed before, there's a lot of organisms that need calcium carbonate and are affected by ocean acidification, including oysters, this microscopic plankton uh, plant called the coccolithophore, fish even, they don't really have hard body parts the same way that oysters do, but they have an inner ear part called an otolith that is really important to their biology. It's made of calcium carbonate. Corals, urchins, abalone, crabs. So I have a number of other fun little calcium carbonate objects that I'll pass around, just so you guys get a sense of the diversity of animals that are affected by this. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> So in addition to this impact on calcium carbonate using organisms, changing the pH of an environment has an impact in other ways on organisms. So all of these plants and animals that live in our ocean today have adapted to an environment with a relatively high pH of about 8.2. And as that declines, it impacts other things besides just the hard body parts. So one thing that's currently be being studied is how a change in pH impacts, for example, clownfish, um, their ability to smell in the water. So this study that I want to tell you guys about looked at how larval clownfish, these tiny cute little creatures, when they are raised either in a high CO2 world, which is a future ocean acidified world, or a low CO2 world, how they're able to detect home. So these animals use their sense of smell. We use our eyesight, right? Or our geographic sense or our GPS, our phones, to find home. These animals use their sense of smell. So as you guys might remember, has anyone seen Finding Nemo? <laughs> yeah, okay, good. I didn't know whether that was something. People still watched, but I love that movie. And Finding Nemo, the clownfish, what's their home? Yeah, right, exactly. An anemone. So they are able to smell anemones, and they're also able to smell other clownfish. So, you know, we can also smell each other. You, like, find somebody by their BO or something. Like, okay, this is a good place. Or, like, for example, <laughs> you know, if we're looking to go to a restaurant, oftentimes we might look and be like, oh, there's a lot of people there. That's popular. That's a good place to go. So these fish do the same thing. They're like oh, there's other clownfish there, maybe that's home, maybe that's a good place to settle down, raise my family. All right, so they use their sense of smell. And they, these larvae were raised in two different conditions, high CO2 and low CO2, and then they were tested given uh, by, they were given this option, they were put into this little tube that was filled with water, and in one side, so they could swim through here, and then the idea was, do they go this way or do they go that way? This way with a little plus sign means there's positive things there. There's anemones, there's other adult clownfish. It should be a place where they can settle down and call home. Over here in the negative sign, they put things like really um, strong smelling leaves of habitats that aren't good for clownfish. And what they wanted to see was if they are raised in these different pHs, are they still able to smell the things that they should go towards, or are they more attracted to things that they shouldn't go towards? Interestingly, what they found was that fish that were raised in a low CO2 environment, so what they've adapted to, kind of current, or you know, a little bit of historic levels, they were like anemones, mom and dad, friends, 
and they went to the things that are supposed to be good for them. Fish that were raised in high CO2 environment, they actually were attracted to things that weren't good home, homes for them. So what we have found is that uh, fish, in particular, this affects their smelling. A similar experiment found that clownfish aren't able to detect predators. So one thing that fish and actually invertebrates use to detect predators in the water is their chemical um, cues and their ability to smell them. And in a changing pH, sometimes they can't smell the predators, so they go straight to them. Okay, do you guys have any questions at this point? Yeah. So I'm curious whether the predators have the same it's the same issue? That is a really good question. I don't know the answer to that. Somebody um, that I work with at the Dega Marine Lab is looking into that interaction between predators and prey and whether the predators can detect their prey. But I imagine, like, on principle, I imagine that they might have a similar issue finding their, their prey if they use chemical cues in the water. It's a good question. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, what basis are you getting the clownfish um, smell where to go? Because um, I mean, I used to breed clownfish, and that mm -hmm. did not have an effect. I mean, clownfish have very like complex hierarchical structures. They'll have the dominant female, which is the largest reproducing fish, the dominant male, which is slightly smaller, and then at most they'll have one other um, like juvenile macrophytic fish that will replace. Yeah. Well, the reproducing fish, one from that. Um, no, so. that's a really good question. So um, I maybe didn't make it completely clear that what this is, is when, when the juveniles, because of this hierarchical structure, when the little juveniles are ready to leave home and find a new place because they need to leave and resettle. A lot of animals do this. Beavers, they, they get kicked out of their house and they have to go find a new appropriate environment. Um, that's when this happens. So the larvae, just like with a lot of organisms, the larvae travel around in the ocean for a little while and then they settle. And that's what happens with these clownfish too. They travel around and they're looking for an appropriate place to settle down and live. So that's when that happens. That's a good question. Anybody else? Okay, great. So I also just wanted to mention that, of course, plants are affected by the increased carbon dioxide in the water. This can uh, increase photosynthesis, um, which can be beneficial to some plants, but some plants are better able to use that increased CO2 in the water than others. So that means some plants will be able to grow faster and outcompete other plants, and that means a changing composition of communities. That means some plants start doing way better and other plants do worse, and so we're seeing a lot of changes. And lastly, there are some algae that are photosynthetic that actually do make hard body parts out of calcium carbonate. So they're affected the same way as the animals I passed around in that they have a harder time making their uh, hard body parts. Okay, the other thing I just wanted to explain was that one of the issues with ocean acidification is that it's not happening alone. There's also other stressors like increased temperature or changes in pollution in the water. So a lot of uh, organisms that are affected by ocean acidification, they are dealing with multiple stressors. And for those of you at my talk yesterday, we talked a little bit about this. But there's been a um, meta-analysis, which means people have looked at all of the research on ocean acidification paired with other stressors, and what they find is that oftentimes it's a synergistic response. And what that means is that when you look at two stressors, I'm going to show this, explain this in a graph. So you look at two stressors that have a negative impact on something. So this is just to illustrate the, uh, syner what synergism means. So you have something like photosynthetic efficiency on the y-axis, which is really good for plants, more photosynthesis. You have a control where you have this much photosynthesis, and you have some stressor, like temperature, that is bad for these plants. And it decreases their photosynthesis by a little bit. You have another stressor, like UV, which decreases it a little bit more. And if those two things combined at the same time have what's called
called an additive effect, then that means that what you would expect is you'd expect the decrease from temperature, which is 0 0.1, 0 0.5 to 0 0.4, to be added to the decrease associated with your second stressor, 0 0.5 to 0.3. So that would be a 0.3 decrease, and you'd expect this when those two are combined. You'd expect it to be this decrease added to this decrease, and you'd have this. The synergistic response means that you actually have a worse scenario than would be expected. And this is what usually happens with ocean acidification. So the reason I wanted to explain this to you guys is that ocean acidification can really be magnified by some of these other stressors. Okay, so there's a lot of current research being done about this, open questions about whether organisms can adapt to ocean acidification, whether we can actually predict what's going to happen with all of these different stressors, and a lot of geologists looking at, and oceanographers looking at whether we can learn from the past when there used to be acidified conditions and um, see what things were like back then. So this has some management implications that I wanted to just go over with you guys. One of them is, of course, in order to lessen ocean acidification, just like with climate change, what we really need to do is take some action on the root cause, which is CO2, greenhouse gas emissions. However, that's uh, difficult sometimes. So there are other things we can do uh, in the meantime. One of them is to try to decrease other stressors. So because ocean acidification interacts with other stressors to make the impact on organisms particularly bad. If you can eliminate some of those other stressors that are easier, still may be difficult, but a little bit easier to get traction on, like pollution, okay, it can be a local issue, then you might be able to help those animals and plants deal with ocean acidification by removing other stressors. So that's something we can try to do in the meantime. Then there's also um, some really specific management things that we can do with uh, businesses like shellfish aquaculture, they're already seeing ramifications of ocean acidification, having a hard time growing their oysters for all of us to eat. And what they are doing to try to manage this is acti actually actively monitoring the water and closing down operations when it gets acidified and opening them back up when the water is more um, conducive to oyster shell growth. So that's a neat way in which, I know in Northern California, scientists are pairing with business uh, to help manage that aquaculture. One other management thing, uh, option, that some people have talked about is something called ocean engineering. If we're putting the acid in, can't we just put something else in to neutralize it? Um, and this is something that, it, what's that? To tongues, yeah, let's all buy a lot of tongues. Um, <laughs> and yeah, so there are people thinking maybe we can mine something and just dump it in the ocean. Um, this is a pretty controversial topic and something that I would like to discuss with you guys in our discussion section um, or next class. Um, but some people think it's a great idea and other people think, you know, that's going to require a lot of energy and mining and resources to do that. Let's just try to deal with, with the greenhouse gas emissions. And lastly, I just want to mention one other thing, which is that with climate change, there's been a lot of controversy about whether or not there's a scientific consensus. With ocean acidification, it's pretty clear that there's a consensus that this is happening. And we know, because of the really uh, basic chemistry, what the problem is. And so there's the possibility to take advantage of this greater consensus around ocean acidification science than around climate change and try to push for action that way. One of the problems with that is that there is an issue with public perception. So some of you guys in here knew a lot about ocean acidification. Some people probably didn't know much about it before coming here today. And I have talked with a lot of people when I'm doing my research about ocean acidification, and most people look at me like, what? What are you talking about? So um, the Ocean Conservancy and EDGE research did a survey of people in the US to find out what they know, and ocean acidification is not well known. 
people tend not to understand that the living ocean is important. They understand that we need water, but they don't necessarily understand that the oceans produce most of the oxygen for our planet and that there are a lot of resources living in the ocean that could be affected by this that are important. People tend to think that the consequences will be in the future, but like we discussed, they're already happening, and people are unclear about how it will affect them or what they could do. So there are a lot of educational opportunities, and I think that this is an important thing if we are going to try to use ocean acidification to affect management, to change public perception. So I wanted to get some of your ideas. Um, I want you to spend just a moment thinking if we want to use ocean acidification consensus to try to make change in our policy, first, who would we need to target? Would we go out to K through 12 classrooms, try to educate all the kids, bring it out through the curriculum? Would we go out to public beaches and talk to people? Would we go to legislators? Who would it make sense to inform about this? And how, what are some strategies we could use to change public perception? So what I want you guys to do really quickly is just spend a minute or two, maybe 30 seconds thinking in your own brain, I'll time you, and then after I give you the signal, I want you to turn to the person or people at your table, just share what you've been thinking about this, and then we'll talk for a minute, okay? So just a few seconds in your own mind. Okay, now if you guys will turn to each other and see whether you have any ideas about what audience and how to deal with this issue of public perception. <laughs> Let's go. All right, so I want to bring everybody back together, just share a couple of thoughts. So I was talking with some groups, it sounded like some people definitely thought engaging the younger generation was a good idea that not to offend anybody, but some people think the younger generation is maybe more open um, and that they can then influence people older than them talk to their parents. Um, but the problem with that is that it might be a delay in action. Um, so I want to see if other people had other audiences that they thought might be particularly good to target. Yeah, Paul. I was when I go for both the older and younger, you get media action from those who have money and in a position to take action, and then you have a foundation for and if we all work on this, we can do that. We can have multiple strategies. Anybody else have an idea they felt like might work? So I suggested a comes drive. Ooh. <laughs> um, with a, you know, doing the math, you know, that, that each person's contribution would need to be four or five hundred pounds. That sounds great. As opposed to actually doing something wrong. <laughs> Um, cool. Well, thank you for sharing your thoughts. Uh, I just want to leave you guys with uh, a description of an opportunity. So if I were to come to CI, one of the things that I'd be interested in doing is interviewing the public on Southern California beaches about their perception of ocean acidification. So we know what, in general, people in the U.S. might think, but what do people here in a coastal community know about it? and then using information from those interviews to actually, within a course with undergrads, design some ocean acidification curriculum. And in that class, teams of students would do what you guys just did over the course of a semester. They'd choose a target audience and work with me and their peers to design some targeted education and we'd go out in the community and do that. So if you guys are interested in that, it may become real someday. Um, <laughs> and I just want to thank you for your attention and for attending my talk, and um, hopefully, I know I went a little long, but hopefully there's still some time for questions.